of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and
words of the Nicene Creed is found on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us on the cross of Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is the worship and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue now with singing together hymn number 464, the strife is o'er, the battle done. Number 464.
they faced a difficult task. On Friday, they witnessed Jesus' crucifixion. They knew the nature of the job that awaited them. So they got up early in the morning to do some work. This was a work they felt was their duty to do. It would not be pleasant, but it was something that they were willing to do because of their love. So it happens that they gathered together the spices and the ointments and all of the things necessary for preparing a body. And they went to the cemetery expecting to unwrap Jesus' earthly remains and prepare them for a proper, proper burial according to their customs. These women were very much like the women who are very close to me in my life. They are willing to do some unpleasant but necessary things because of a sense of duty and because of their love. You too may know women such as these. And so they went. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. What a surprise. There was no body in the tomb. It was empty. While they wondered about this, suddenly two men that in clothes that dazzled their eyes stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? The hearts of these women were filled with love for Jesus. But they lacked something. They lacked something of ultimate importance. What they did here plays out over and over again in our lives. They were looking for the living among the dead. How often this happens also to us today. People look for life in all the wrong places. I guess that most of you have seen, if not at least heard, of the TV show American Idol. The part that I like the least although some people may like it the best, is the beginning of the season when some contestants make fools of themselves. Why do they do this? Is it because they're looking for fame? Do they believe their lives will suddenly be fulfilled if somehow they become famous? I believe the Easter angels would look at people with this attitude and say, why do you seek the living among the dead? Fame has no eternal value. How many of us can name the top movie stars from the silent film era? Fame is fleeting. Money, possessions, power, they all go away. So why do you seek the living among the dead? Others may seek fulfillment in life from pleasure, the pleasure of the five senses. Why do some people act immorally? Why do some people drink too much, eat too much? Why do some people use illegal drugs or abuse proper ones? For many people, Pleasure can become the ultimate goal of life. An effort to make life something more than what they're already experiencing. But they'll ultimately discover that they're looking for the living, their own lives, among the dead. Others may seek fortune. It's tempting to believe that in some way life will have value if I have more things, if my house is bigger, if my garage is full, if I command industry, then my life will be fulfilled. But all lives, whether they're filled with fame or fortune or pleasure or anything else in the world, are lives that end, not with an empty tomb, 
but in a tomb that's filled with a body. Your body. This is the definite consequence of looking for the living among the dead. Even religious commitment and fervor can lead to seeking the living among the dead. If you found yourself on this fruitless quest, you're not alone. Martin Luther, too, sought the living among the dead when he went to the monastery. He sought the living among the dead when he deprived and punished himself for his impure thoughts and desires. For many years he lived lacking the very same thing the women that first Easter morning were lacking. He says, though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. His heart ached because he believed that he was a miserable sinner and eternally lost. The women went to the tomb with love in their hearts for Jesus. In fact, these women may have loved Jesus more deeply at that moment than anyone else in the entire world. But they were lacking one thing. They were lacking faith. They had not believed Jesus' words that on the third day, he would rise. They expected to find the tomb filled with Jesus' body, not empty. What is it that you and I need to know? What should the women have known that morning? What should they have believed? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. What is this? What is the gospel? It is this, for I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's what happened on Good Friday, when Jesus died on the cross. This is an astounding and wonderful message from St. Paul. He passes on to us the message of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, for our sins. The cross hadn't been a colossal miscalculation on God's part or a defeat of God's plan. It was the plan. And it was for us. And how do we know that? Because also, in accordance with the scriptures, Jesus was buried, he was raised on the third day, and he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. Jesus' death and resurrection is for you. This is the gospel. This is what gives life. Had the women that first Easter morning understood and believed this, that Jesus' death was part of God's plan for saving them, they would have expected Jesus to rise rather than look to the living among the dead. Living, true Life is found in that Jesus died for us, and now he is risen. He is risen indeed. Try that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Remember, it happens any time. <coughs> this is life for all who believe. Fame and fortune and pleasure are fleeting, but faith gives life eternal. Just as Christ's tomb was empty on Easter, so also in the resurrection of the dead, we will be raised 
and our tombs will also be empty. It wasn't until our beloved reformer Martin Luther became thoroughly acquainted with the scriptures that he discovered the wonderful message of salvation that he shares in his catechisms. We've been studying Luther's catechisms throughout the season of Lent, so that's why it's kind of coming to a, a culmination here. After years of studying the Bible, he finally discovered what it had meant all along. This for you, for our sins, which is the gospel. Jesus had died for Luther's sins and granted him forgiveness through faith. Luther reports, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. This was such a wonderful and thrilling discovery for Luther that he declares, I felt that I was altogether born again and entered paradise itself through open doors. This so changed Luther's life that he spent his remaining years striving in every way possible to bring this marvelous message to people who had been starved of the gospel. The small catechism was part of that tireless effort. In it, he writes concerning the second article of the Creed, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, Purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil. Not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. That I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. And then, Luther finished his second article explanation with this last clause. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. Think about what that means. Luther is saying that we have been redeemed by Jesus' precious blood. That we will live forever with Christ in his kingdom just as surely as the fact that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Okay, you were expecting that. Good. And now he lives and reigns for all eternity. In other words, if Jesus is truly raised from the dead, if today Easter is true, then we will live. If we can be sure of that, of Jesus' resurrection, we can be just as sure that we will live also. Therefore, it is also real for each of us. We have been purchased and won from the power of sin, death, and the devil. We have entered paradise through the open gates of the gospel. We will live with Christ forever in his kingdom. The cross and the empty tomb are for us, but not for us alone. We join with St. Paul, with Martin Luther, and with Christians throughout the ages in dedicating our lives to sharing this life in the living one with others. We join the likes of John Chrysostom, one of the most famous preachers in all history. He lived from the mid-300s to the early 400s. For a time, he was the Archbishop of Constantinople. One of his Easter sermons is so famous that in Eastern Orthodox churches, which use a different calendar, so they'll be celebrating Easter next week. In their first service on Easter Day, just after midnight, his sermon is read every year, even till this day. 
It does us well to hear his words this morning. Words that for 1,600 years have been speaking the life of Easter to Christian people. He starts off and repeats, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the right response. But now I have to ask you to hold off and don't interrupt this quote from his Easter sermon because he says it a lot. We want to get through it. <laughs> Christ is risen and you, O death, are annihilated. Christ is risen and the evil ones are cast down. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life is liberated. Christ is risen and the tomb is emptied of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, is become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds forever. In Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now on the bottom of page 192 with singing together our offertory, Created Me. Please rise. Especially in Russia, 
that they might be inclined to walk in the ways of righteousness and peace and cease military hostilities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless Joseph, our president, Michael, our governor, Christina, our mayor, and all who make and administer our laws. Frustrate the forces of evil and do not let our leaders cooperate with them or further their goals. Guard our armed forces as they stand watch for us at home and abroad. Especially as we pray for our local law enforcement and Michael, Frederick, Jason, Thomas, and Spencer in our sheriff's office. Let them all serve with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy on the sick and those in any need. Especially do we pray for Patricia, Mary, Evelyn, and their ongoing needs. For Mark, Barbara, Tony, Mark, and their afflictions. For missionary pastor Daniel Conrad and his upcoming surgeries. And for all those we remember now in our hearts. Let the dawning light of the new creation in Christ sustain them in faith. In accord with your will, grant them renewed health, a foretaste of their eternal healing in Him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us joy in your Son's great victory, a victory feast, as He shares it with us from this altar. In the eating of His true body and the drinking of His precious blood and faith, Overcome our sin by his forgiveness and swallow up our death in his life, that we may be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort those who mourn with the truth of Christ's empty tomb, that in the midst of their grief they may abide in the hope of his resurrection. Uphold them in faith as they await the day when you will wipe every tear from all faces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We join together in singing eternal hallelujahs with the innumerable angels in festal gathering, with the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy, through faith, in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue on page 194 with the service of the Sabbath. The Lord be with you. Your glorious name, evermore praise. 
strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and Now all the vault of heaven resounds, number 465. 